Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. We are back to normal and this is the first video in which I appear uh, after the 30 rolls in 30 days project and I'm super happy to tell you all about the experience that it was to uh, be part of this project and, and, and tell you a little bit more about what I discovered and things that I learned and yeah, let's, let's just dive into it, okay? So first of all, it was an interesting experience because I had to accustom myself to a new camera. That was the whole goal of it. It was this camera. It was the Mamiya 33... It was this camera. It was the Mamiya C330. And I discovered a bunch of things about this camera that I had not discovered before. I decided to do the project with this camera, as I said before, uh, in the previous videos when I started the project and on the second video when I was in the middle of the project, but I will repeat it here in case you haven't seen those videos or in case you did not remember. I wanted to do that project on medium format because I wasn't shooting that much on medium format. I wasn't shooting medium format at all. I, I had a Hasselblad and I was barely ever using it. So when I shot the video of the Kew Gardens uh, in London for the shoot film episode with the Mamiya C330, I really, really enjoyed using it and I decided to use it as the main camera for the project, mainly because it's a medium format camera and it's a new camera and I wanted to try something new. I also wanted to be better at medium format. And there are many things that I discovered about this camera that I had no idea before. When I shoot one of the shoot film episodes, usually what happens is that I shoot cameras that I already know or that I know how to operate them. I mean, if you give me a camera and I have never ever seen that camera before in my life, I'll probably be able to figure it out within the first few minutes, how to operate shutter speed, ISO and aperture and whatever. So it's not that hard to get the grasp of the camera like right away. But uh, that being said, there are many things that cameras that you discover about using cameras when you use them for a long period of time or when you have shoot many rolls with it. Meaning some cameras have a longer learning curve and this camera has a long learning curve. I mean, it's not super long, but it requires a few things that are interesting and I have never uh, experienced with other cameras. Uh, let me tell you all about them. First off, when I started, I had no idea why the, the camera had a lock button. I mean, I knew why it was there. It made sense in a way, but like lock button, really? I thought it was just like, like who needs a lock button in reality? The thing is, I ended up using the lock button a lot because I, I would just grab this camera, put it on my backpack and go to work or go out and shoot. And then when I took the camera out of the backpack, and, and decided to shoot, I would open the camera and be like, okay, I'm ready to shoot now. And it would just won't fire. Like what, what happened? Yeah, of course it got, it, it shot while I was in my backpack. So now I had to recock the shutter and, and use it again. Uh, usually, uh, I mean, not usually, every time I put it on my backpack, it had the uh, lens cap on. So it didn't really matter if it shot or not, but it was, it was not fun to have the camera already shot and like miss, uh, picture. So what I ended up doing was taking the camera out, unlock it, take the cap off, focus, shoot, put the cap, lock it, put it back in the backpack or just hang it on my shoulder. Um, and it be I became super accustomed to locking and unlocking the camera. So that was a nice thing that I thought I would never use and I ended up using the whole time, which is now that I think of it, what usually happens with cameras. Like I see a feature and I say, oh, I'm never going to use it. And then that's basically all our use. Also, some of you might remember on the first roll, there was a shot, like the final shot of the first roll, it was longer and he had two exposures in it. And I would love to say, oh, it was, it was just planned, man. I'm just, that's how I roll. But in reality, that's not how it is. In reality, uh, in that shot, what happened was at the beginning, when you load the film inside the camera, there are like some marks where they say, you should load the film up to this mark. And you put the film and then you start winding it. And there is this weird moment in which you wind and you see the number one, like the first exposure is done, but you're winding like up to the, like to here and you still have half a whole turn to make. So the first time I loaded the camera, I was winding, winding, and then boom, number one. And I was like in the middle, I said, oh man, if I keep winding, I'm going to go to frame number two because I was accustomed to the Hasselblads, which are not automatic. So I get to number one, I was like, okay, I'm not gonna touch it. I'm just gonna use the camera as it is. And I was unable to shoot it because the camera must be completely winded in order to shoot. So what I did was move it to the multi-exposure 
position, take a shot, and then wind it into the second frame and take another shot. And I thought I was doing okay, but in reality, I was just uh, not winding properly. So those two images were stuck one uh, on top of the other. And that's the reason why there is that frame on the first roll. That never happened again because in the second roll I discovered, oh yeah, now I get it, it's automatic. So I can just wind it all the way up. And if it gets to frame number one, the rest of it is not gonna keep winding. It's just so the crank can uh, be ready for shooting. So yeah, that was, that was, I guess that was pretty obvious for everybody who uses this kind of camera. It was new to me, so. That's, you, sometimes you guys gotta pay the price for not knowing stuff. The other thing that I discovered on this camera that was super interesting for me as a learning experience was focusing. Now, I'm gonna talk very briefly about the Hasselblad focusing. The Hasselblad focusing has this problem. It's too long. Like the, the lenses are slow to move and you have to move it slowly and focus and then you can take the shot. There are some like grips that you can grab and move the lens around, but from what I've heard, they end up damaging the lens. I don't know if it's true. I never use them. I was just focusing the lenses. So if, if I think about how I focus, my whole life I have been grabbing the camera with my right hand, get ready for a shutter with my index finger and focusing with my left hand. So that's how I, use all my cameras. And the Mamiya C330 can let you focus with any of those hands, like you can use your left hand or your right hand. So I kept using my left hand, but this time the movement was different than it always is. Usually the movement for focusing is, uh, it's calculated with my fingers. So my fingers are the one that have the muscle memory. If I grab my Leica and I try to focus, I know exactly how long is this movement from this movement, like how many meters it is because I have muscle memory of this. It's like playing an instrument. If you play guitar for a long enough time, you don't like to look at the frets and see what you're doing. You don't even need to think about it. Your body just do it exactly as it should be without having to put any intellectual movement into it. It will just be part of what you do. It's an integral part of your being at that moment, playing the guitar and singing. You're just focusing on like, trying to hit the notes while singing or thinking about the lyrics or whatever, but your fingers are not thinking about the frets they should press. For taking pictures, it's exactly the same in my experience. Focusing at least works like that. I don't think about focusing, I just do it as fast as I can because my muscles, muscles in my fingers are accustomed to this movement. Now, the big difference for me was that this camera is not focused with the fingers, it's focused with the wrist. So you have to move the focus backwards or forward like this. And it doesn't look very complicated, but let me tell you it is because it's a really short focus. For example, I'm on infinity now. This is as far as I can go. I'm focusing on the farthest distance away. And now this is right here. This is like 30 centimeters or less than half a meter. So all I have from half a meter to infinity is this movement. You see this? This is all I have. So in order to remember like half a meter, infinity, there's a few, a few many meters in between this movement. So focusing was really hard because you have to know exactly where you are. So when there's someone passing by and it was about a meter away, I'll be like, okay, this is a meter. And I was usually, um, yeah, I'm actually right. This is like a meter. So it's muscle memory. And that's what I was doing the most when I was trying to focus. I remember where was one meter, where were two meters. And it was just slight movements, like very, very precise movements of the hand. And it, it wasn't like I, was, I wasn't looking at the viewfinder at all. Like that was not my intention. I was moving around and walking through the city and then I see something interesting. I pre-focus with my muscle memory. I check the focus and if it was okay, I will take the shot. That's, that's what I did. Of course, I couldn't nail every single shot and it's impossible to nail every single frame and every single focusing like this. I'm a human after all, but I would say the rate of like correct focusing was good enough because I was practicing a lot. I was taking a, a roll of film a day, so that's a lot of practice. But on top of that, I was practice like a lot. So when I was on the subway uh, commuting to my job, I was like, okay, this is, that person is one meter away. That person is two meter away. And I was trying to remember. Then when I was walking to my job, I was like, okay, that person is passing by. It should be around three meters. And then, okay, that was, that was my hobby to say in some way when I was uh, doing the project. So it, it was an intense experience learning how to focus, but it was quite rewarding. I mean, I feel 
I won't say I feel more connected to the camera now, but I feel like I'm able to react a lot faster due to this difficulty level that a camera has. So that's all I gotta say about the camera. But the camera itself is just a part of the experience. The other part of the experience is actually shooting with the camera uh, and, and taking it out to the streets and meeting people or walking by people and using it. Um, some, some people commented on the comment section like, oh, you must be really cool to have this TLR and people would notice you because you're not looking at them directly. In my experience, this is not universal, this is my experience, and this, if this is not your experience, that's completely fine. But in my experience, the camera draws a lot of attention. And because it draws a lot of attention, if you're not looking at the person directly, if you're looking through this weird thing and trying to move around, because I, 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 you use it on your waist, right? So you're using a, a weird thing like this and not looking at the eyes of the people. It looks super creepy. So I needed to step forward and try to bring my best self when I was approaching people on the street and try to be like extra smiley, extra friendly, extra not threatening at all. So my whole point was trying to be as positive and as good as possible. And I'm gonna be honest, I'm not a big fan of the, yeah, you gotta be positive, man, and the positive vibes, and this like, yeah, this positive energy. I'm not into that. But if you're gonna take pictures of the people in the street without their permission, you can't be like, yeah, I'm just, I don't care. I'm just cool, you know? You gotta be a nice person and you gotta present yourself in a nice way. And that's what I did. I tried to bring my best self and by trying to be the less obtrusive that I could, people would at some point let me in. Uh, and when I say by let me in, they would just not stare at me with like anger or bother, or they would see that I'm there, they would acknowledge I'm there, and they would keep just doing their stuff. So I will have the opportunity to take the shot. That was usually what happened. Now, with that being said, having the permission to take the shot and having the muscle memory to focus and take the shot, it's also one fraction of the whole thing. The other big thing about this camera, and it's super obvious for everyone who knows about this, it's that it's square format. And I have never been able to compose properly for square format. I think it's super hard and I envy greatly the people who are able to shoot in medium format, in square format, and just have awesome pictures. I, I just love it. I think it's they look super nice and they look super like well composed, but it's so hard to actually achieve that. I see some people taking amazing shots in square form, and I'm like, how do they do it? How do they think about these pictures? And I would like to make a longer video about composing for different formats, but I can tell you like my experience on what I had to learn for composing for this particular uh, format, which is the square format, and it's this. Usually when you compose, you have like a narrative, or if not a narrative in a proper way, you have like a visual narrative. You have like different elements that are moving and there's like a certain flow in the visuals. And you can see the picture and you don't absorb it right away. You absorb it by pieces. You see there's like one element in here and there's something repeats in there and something else repeats in there and then you have like a little flow, like a small song, like a small moment, a, a little piece of art in a way. And it can have some narrative elements. Usually the easiest thing is to compose with three elements in a picture, right? But with the square format, that's not enough. If you have like a square format, you can put things on top, down, left, right, or the corners, or the center, and that's it. That's all you have to play. There are no many lines of tension. When you have a longer format, you can have longer lines of tension. And you can have elements on the very edge of the picture and an element on the middle or on the other edge of the picture. And because the format is longer, you can have a line of tension between them. And that's cool. But on square format, that is not an option. I mean, you can do it, but it doesn't feel long enough to give you air. It feels like everything is packed. So how do you create tension lines in a space that is packed? The answer that I found and again, this should be obvious for everybody who's shooting regularly square format, but this was my first long-term experience with it. You can still create those tension lines, but they have to work in layers. So you're not working to, in, in, in 2D to the extremes of the picture. You're thinking your picture in 3D. 
So you're thinking you can compose with two people in here and one people in the background, or you can focus different elements and you have to constantly think about layers. That is one interesting thing that it, it started happening to me like around the middle of the project when I started to feel like, oh, okay, okay, I get it. I, I somehow get it how this works. Because at the beginning I was trying to apply the logic of regular cameras and regular format, like 35 millimeter format to the medium format to the square format. I was trying to put people on the center or put people on the sides or compose like everything more or less organized. But then as the project started to evolve, I discovered that I needed to add layers and I needed to have some movement. And the only way to add movement in this place so confined was this thing. So that was interesting. And yeah, that, that, that small realization, which might be pretty obvious, but for me it was new, uh, follow me all the way through until the end of the project, which is uh, the day number 30. And yeah, those were 30 days, man. That was an intense ride. Some people wanted me to give you some insights about the pictures that I was taking, but I actually did that a lot of times on my Instagram. So if you follow me on Instagram, uh, you can see all the comments that I did and I took some pictures and I was talking about why I like the picture and when I took it and whatnot, because I think if I really like a picture and I want to talk about it, I don't want to contaminate another video with a lot of information about this specific picture and whatnot. I guess it's easier. You can just choose not to watch it on Instagram. And if you like a particular picture, you can enter it and see the description and understand where it came from. So that's what I'm doing. If you follow me on Instagram, you can get that info. At the same time, I would like to thank you a lot, guys, because Many of you were super into the project and were giving me uh, nice feedback and support and it was super necessary because at one point I was like struggling like crazy. But the project is done and I'm really happy that the channel is back to normal. So next week there's going to be uh, another shoot episode and I hope to see you there. And yeah, that's it. Thanks a lot for sticking by and for subscribing and for passing by. And thanks a lot, guys. You rock and keep shooting.